I want to uh, uh, highlight this idea of, of living for God in our, our daily experiences, the experiences that we have each and every day. And, you know, last week we, we looked at this thought of, of, um, of how we're new, we're new in Christ, amen? We're, we're new creatures in Christ Jesus. And so we're going to kind of parallel that a little bit this morning. But just as we do that, let me, uh, let, let's just ask the, the presence of the Holy Spirit to just fall in this place as we read the word of God. Amen. We, we, we read the word and we want the Lord to change us and change our hearts. So Heavenly Father, we thank you again for uh, this morning and the privilege, the opportunity to read the words of truth. We thank you for the sword of the Spirit uh, that is in our life. We thank you, Father God, for the words that you have spoken, the promises of God, the truths of God. And Lord, today, even as we look at these truths, some of them hard truths, God, we pray that you would shape us. God, you'd work on the inside of us. Lord, that we would go home changed, that we would go home uh, a different, and Lord, we would just receive everything that the Holy Spirit is deciding to do this morning as he guides us into the message of the, uh, of the gospel of Jesus and the truth of God. We love you and we thank you. And everybody said, amen. So there's this idea, this thought of, of are you living for God in your daily experiences? And so we're going to look at Colossians chapter 3. I've put a lot of the verses in your notes, but we're also going to uh, uh, be in Luke chapter 19. You know, if we follow Paul's strategies, here's the thing. Paul gives us strategies. He lays out strategies in Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians. And if we follow Paul's strategies, we can become overcomers. Amen? Do you believe that? Do you believe that you have overcome because of what Jesus has done for us. And if we will follow these strategies, we'll see God working in our lives. So our first verse is Colossians chapter 3, verse 1. It says, since you have been raised to new life with Christ. You've been raised to a new life with Christ. And maybe we ask that question, well, what does, what does this new life look like? You know, what does, what does this mean? What does it mean to be living this, this new life in Christ? Well, well, here's the thing. It means that we change our, our moral and our ethical behavior by letting Christ live in us. Christ comes and lives in us, and he shapes us into who that we are called to be who we are supposed to be. And the thing is, is the Holy Spirit helps with that. We said last week that in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 24, that you must display the new nature because you're a new person created in the image of God. Okay, so are we displaying this new nature? And, and, and we work with the Holy Spirit. We align ourselves with the third person of the Trinity as he's developing in us this new nature. We're becoming new. Remember, it says in the scripture, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old is gone. The new has come. What does that mean? That means I don't live like I used to. Come on. Are you hearing me? Okay, we're going to get up and go. I got a lot this morning. I don't live like I used to. I don't live the old way. I am a new creation. And it's really that thought of, am I a better Christian today than I was yesterday? Am I closer to God today than I was yesterday? Am I, am I listening to him? Because here's the thing. The Holy Spirit is constantly working to reproduce the character of Christ in your life. Praise God. It, it means that, that, that in your, your, your conduct should match your faith. See, if, if you're a Christian... And, and, I, and I, hope, I hope all of you have received the Lord as Savior. We're going to have an opportunity to do that at the end of the service as we take communion. But if you're a Christian and you've asked Christ into your life, you should act like a Christian. Come on. To, to be a Christian means much more than just making a good resolution for the year. Okay, it, 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 it means it, it's more than just, just uh, having good intentions in your life. It actually means you're beginning to take the right actions according to what the Holy Spirit says in the Word of God, what, what God has put for us, what the Holy Spirit is pointing us towards. This is a, this is a pretty straightforward step. It's, it's, it's black and white. The, the Word of God says, don't do this, but do this. And, and we really struggle. We're struggling with truth. We're struggling with truth in our culture. Paul would say, don't live like this. Don't live this way. Don't live the sinful way, but live this way. Follow Christ. Listen to the Holy Spirit. Follow God's example. So in, in Colossians chapter 1, uh, or, or chapter 3, verse 1, the second part of that verse is this. Set your sight 
or set your mind, as another translation would say, on the realities of heaven where Christ sits in the place of honor at God's right hand. Verse 2, think about the things of heaven. Hallelujah. Praise God. You ever just sit around and think about heaven? Think about the things of heaven, not the things of the earth. Another translation would say, think about the heavenly things. Okay, what are the heavenly things? Well, that's the, that's the kingdom of God. That's the purposes of God. That's the character and the nature of Jesus. Okay, are you following me? That's the fruit of the Spirit. Are we striving to put the heavenly priorities into the daily practice of our life? And the Word says, be imitators of God. Be imitators of Christ. So you got to remember, Paul is preaching to the church. He's talking to church people, and he says, be imitators of Christ, and let the Holy Spirit produce the, the, the fruit of Christ in your life. Listen, we have this example, and our example is Jesus, and we want the fruit of Jesus to come out in our lives. The, 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 the way Jesus is, the character of Jesus, that's the, the fruit of the Spirit. Galatians chapter 5, verse 25, we're not going to read the whole passage. You, we looked at that last week. You can go back and look at it. But verse 25, it says this. It says, if we claim to live by the Holy Spirit, we must also walk by the Holy Spirit. Come on. Are, are, are you tracking with me? Which is uh, with personal integrity. We have godly character. The Amplified Version says we have moral courage. It goes on and says our conduct is empowered by the Spirit of God. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Last week, our thoughts were being led by the Spirit involves some things. It involves this desire to hear, right? This desire to hear what God wants to do. It's this readiness to obey the Word after we've, we've seen and after we've heard. But it's this sensitivity to discern as well. Discern between your feelings and your promptings. You know, we need discernment there. And, and that we should live each day controlled and guided by the Holy Spirit. Then the words of Christ will be in your mind. The love of Christ will be behind your action. The power of Christ will help you control your selfish desires. Selfish desires. Everybody has them. I have them. You have them. Help us, Jesus. Help us, Jesus, not to give in to those selfish desires. The thing is, is if we're going to be fruitful, we have to surrender, right? We have to surrender our hearts to God. Jesus taught us that. Remain in me. There's something about remaining in God. Hallelujah. Abiding in him, in relationship, in communion with him. Remain in me, and I will remain in you. As a branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless you abide in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. Jesus would say, I am the vine and you are the branches. He who remains in me and I in him will bear much fruit, praise God, for without me you can do nothing. That's pretty black and white. We need Jesus. We need Jesus in everything. Without me you can do nothing. So when Christ has formed in us, his personality is duplicated in our heart and our life. So Paul gives us strategies. Back to Colossians chapter 3. And you've got the verses in front of you. I'm not going to read the entirety of the verse. But I just want to point out these things. These are strategies to help us live for God day by day. These are important strategies. The first one is this. You imitate Christ's compassionate, forgiving attitude. And the verse is right there. It's verse 12. It says, put on a heart of compassion and kindness and humility and gentleness and patience. Amen. Praise the Lord. The second one is let love guide your life. And, and, and we see this. We see that the love should be first in our heart and our life. I spoke on this a few weeks back talking about the love of God, but we are to wrap ourselves in the unselfish love of God. Praise the Lord. Aren't you thankful that nothing can separate us from the love of God? Number three, we let the peace of Christ rule in our heart, and he ends this last part, and always be thankful. Are you thankful today? Are you grateful for what God has done in your heart and your life? It says in verse 15, let the peace of Christ, let the inner calm of, of one who walks daily with him be the controlling factor of the heart. Praise God. And then have this heart of gratefulness and thankfulness. Number four, keep the word of God at all times. This is a big one. 
We have to stay in the word of God. Okay, the word of God is important. The truth of God is important. Uh, it, listen, if you need a word from God, get in the word of God. Come on. Are you, are you hearing me? Keep the word of God at all times. Paul, uh, Paul says dwelling in your hearts. And, and he, goes, he takes it a step further in the, in the Amplified, dwelling in your hearts and in your mind. And he says it's permeating every aspect of your being, every part of your being. Praise God. The last one is live as a representative of Jesus Christ. Amen. He is our Savior. He is the King of kings and the Lord of lords. And it says whatever you do, no matter what it is in word or deed, do it in the name of the Lord Jesus and in dependence on him, dependence on Jesus. Amen. See, if you're a Christian, if you're a Christ follower, you act like a Christian. You do Christian things. Okay, we don't, we don't act like non-Christians. Sometimes we do. Sometimes Christians act like non-Christians. But I'm telling you today, we need to act like a Christian. And we need to do Christian things. And there's a few things that we should remember today. And I told you we, was, we were going to be a little bit in Luke chapter 19. I'm going to just hit a few thoughts. I spoke on these, uh, a few of these before, but they're just, they're just good reminders as we look at the strategies of God and what God's trying to do in our heart and our life. I did not put these in your notes so you can write them down. The first one is this, you need to follow Jesus. You have to follow Jesus. You got to remember he's a shepherd, right? The shepherd goes before us. The shepherd goes ahead of us. There, there are times when we get in a hurry, right? We want to jump out in front of God without even considering what the Lord may be saying to us or trying to say to us because by, by nature we are impatient people. That's something that all of us have to work on. The fact is we must be patient with God and what he's doing in our heart, in our life, amen? We must be patient with him concerning the present moment. We must be patient with him concerning the future. We fail to allow the Holy Spirit to lead and direct our lives sometimes and we get out ahead of God because of our impatience, when we get ahead of God, we get ourselves into a mess. We get ourselves in trouble. And in Luke chapter 19, we see where Jesus stays out in front of the disciples. This is as he's, uh, he, he's uh, you know, this is really the triumphant entry. It's that great, that great passage that we, we celebrate on Palm Sunday when we say, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. But we see Jesus stayed out in front of the disciples. And for what purpose? It was to lead as a shepherd would lead, praise God. God. We still have to allow the shepherd to lead from the front. We want to follow the leading of the Holy Spirit in our lives, in every part of our life. If you're not sure uh, what your direction is, or like my friend Richard says, what our towards is, where we hit it towards, right? We're hitting the golf ball. If we're not sure, you, listen, the thing is, is that we need to get close to Jesus and we need to get in the Word of God. We want to follow the leading of the Holy Spirit in our life. This following Jesus is surrendering. It's surrendering our life to him in every aspect, in every part. Remember Jesus told his disciples, follow me and I will make you fishers of men. Fishers of men. Living as Christ's representatives is one of our thoughts. Follow Jesus and he'll make you into the person he's called you to be. Are you hearing me? Follow Jesus, and he'll make you into the person that he's called you to be. Number two, uh, just because, and this is a tough one, and I love you, I love you, but hear my heart. Just because you go to church, it doesn't mean you're alive. This is a big one. It doesn't mean you're spiritually alive. Any, anybody can go to church. But just because you go to church, it doesn't mean you're alive. My question is, are you connected are you connected to the Savior? See, we must stay full of the Holy Spirit. Are, are, you, are you tracking with me? The Bible says, be ye being filled. That's a constant process. That's just not a filling that happens one time. We, we continue to be filled. This is, what ha, this is having a relationship with God. And that's what it looks like. You, you continue to be filled with the Holy Spirit. This is working on the relationship with God. Are you full of, of the life and the presence of the Spirit of God, the third person of the Trinity? Are you full? 
Because without the free-flowing life of the Holy Spirit, the presence of the Holy Spirit, then, then, then your worship is just a ritual. Your worship would be dead, and it would be ritualistic. We have to guard against becoming empty. We, we have to constantly be saying, Lord, here is my cup. Here's my cup, Lord. Fill it up, God. Fill me to the top and overflowing. I don't want to be half. I don't want to be a quarter. I don't want to be a third or two thirds. I want to be overflowing, brimming over the top, full of the presence of the Holy Spirit. And you have to cultivate the presence of the Holy Spirit. You have to spend time with the Holy Spirit. You have to get to know the Holy Spirit. You have to be in the Word. You cultivate this relationship with God by spending time with Him. Number three, we have a Savior that cries for us. It says in Luke chapter 19, as he drew near, he saw the city and he wept. He cried. He cried over the city. See, this is right before Jesus was about to die on the cross. And Jesus knew, he knew exactly what was about to happen. He understood that those he loved would reject him and push him away. He knew people were just playing the game. They were playing the religious game. Listen, every time we are disobedient and we start playing the religious game with God, it breaks the heart of Jesus. And, and let me tell you, he weeps over you. He prays for you. He loves you. He is your Savior. Jesus deserves more than our strong religious feeling or our strong religious belief. The, uh, Paul said, in, or the writer of Hebrews said in, in, in uh, chapter 6, verse 6, he said, if we, if we, say we, if we deviate from the faith, if we turn away from, from our allegiance, then we nail upon the cross the Son of God again. Look what he says. And we are holding him up to contempt and shame and public disgrace. Jesus knew that this was fixing to happen. And, and when he came into Jerusalem and he, and he, and he saw everyone, the Bible says that he, you know, he wept. He knew what was about to happen. He understood that those he loved would reject him. But here's the thing, you have to remember this. He is the Redeemer, amen? And Redeemer means what? It means to make something acceptable. It means to restore the reputation, hallelujah. It means to atone from human sin. This is what the dictionary says, to atone from human sin. It means to keep a promise. Jesus is absolutely invested in the relationship with each and every one of us. He died on the cross for our sins. And the great thing is, is that even though we've rejected him and pushed him aside and, and, and made some mistakes and done things in our lives that we shouldn't do, he still weeps over us. He still loves us. And forgiveness is still still available for each and every one of us. The psalmist said, if you, Lord, kept account of our sin, who could stand God but with you there's forgiveness? It's exactly what man needs, that, that you may be reverently worshipped. And he would say, hope in the Lord, for with the Lord there is mercy and loving kindness and plenty of redemption. Praise God. Number four, many people are spiritually blind. Say Blind. Blind to the truth of God's word. I told you some of these were a little tough today. Their hearts are calloused, and they cannot spiritually reason or discern the things of God. Spiritual blindness isn't just limited to people who don't know God. Okay, Jesus said to the church of the Christians of Laodicea, he was talking about blindness. He's talking to the church. He says, I know your works. You are neither cold nor hot. He says, I wish you were cold or hot. So then because you are lukewarm, you are neither cold nor hot, I will vomit you out of my mouth because you say I am rich and have become wealthy and have need of nothing and, and do not know that you are wretched, you are miserable, you are poor, you are blind, and you are naked. This is Jesus. He's saying this is what you are. This is the state that you are in. You are in this state. And he says, I counsel you to buy gold refined in the fire. Hallelujah. Refiner's fire. My heart's one desire, come on, is to be holy. 
is to be set apart. See, in our, in, in our day and time, people are in our world and in the church, the universal church, some of us are spiritually blind. Are you blind? Are you spiritually blind? Are you just checking the box when you come in here on a Sunday? Number five, he is still. He is still the son of God. He is still the savior of the world, the alpha, the omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. He is Jehovah Jireh, amen? He's Jehovah Nisi, our banner. He is the, the Lord God that heals us, Jehovah Rapha, praise God. He's still the savior. And it says in Luke 19, and, and he's talking to, uh, he's, he's in this place where he's with the Pharisees and, and the chief priests, the scribes and the leaders. It says, as he was teaching daily in the temple, and he was teaching daily in the temple, but the chief priests and the scribes and the leaders of the people sought to kill him. They sought to destroy him. And they were unable to do anything for all of the other people that were there were very attentive to hear him and what he was saying and what he was, he was teaching. This is, this is a tragedy. This is sad. You know, it's, it's a real tragedy that, that these people, the scribes and the, and, and the chief priests and, the, and the, the leaders, they did not see Jesus for who he really was, the Savior of the world, the Son of God. And that day, the Savior of the world passes them by. Listen, Jesus Christ, the Savior of the world, is in this place today. He is passing by this place this morning. Do you understand who is in our midst? Do you understand who is with you? The Son of God, the creator of the universe, is passing by this morning. And the question is, is will we as a church, will, will we turn him away? Or will we submit to him by giving him every area of our life? What will we do? See, Jesus is considered this, this good shepherd, remember? He says, I am the good shepherd in John chapter 10, verse 14, and I lay down my life for the sheep. No one takes it from me. I lay it down. He says, I have the authority to lay down my life for you, and I have the authority to take possession of my life again because he is the son of God. Hallelujah. The good shepherd, he chose the path of laying down his life for the sheep. First John 5, 12 says, he who has the son of God has life. He who does not have the son of God does not have life. It's pretty basic. It's pretty cut and dry right there. Where are you at? We talked about how the truth is, you know, it's pretty simple. It's right there. It's in the scripture. And at the beginning of, of Luke 19, uh, Jesus is on his way. He's visiting Jericho. You remember that great story? And he runs into the wee little man. He runs into Zach. He runs into the tax collector and he says to him today salvation has come to this house for the son of man has come to seek and save that which was lost that's who Jesus is that's what he's about he's about seeking and saving he's about changing he's about bringing hope he's about bringing salvation that's why Paul said if anyone is in Christ he is a new creation the old is gone and the new has come now there is hope there's hope for everybody there's hope for common people it's Jesus Christ. Listen, Christ gives us the power to live for him now. Now. Not, not, not just later, but now. He gives us the hope. And if we follow the strategies that Paul lays out in Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, we become an overcomer. Thank God that he gives us the power to overcome. The psalmist talks about God, and he says God is awesome in his sanctuary. He says the God of Israel gives power and strength to his people. Praise God. Uh, remember I told you last week that an overcomer in the Greek is one who by God's grace received through faith in Christ. You've experienced the new birth. You remain constant in victory over sin, the world, and Satan. Listen, Jesus watches over you. Jesus empowers you by giving you the Holy Spirit to help you overcome anything that is, thrown, that is thrown at us. And I got news for you. The power of God is stronger than the power of the devil. 
The power of God, I don't know what you're dealing with or what you're going through, but the power of God is stronger than the power of the devil. I don't know what people have been telling you, but the power of God is stronger than the power of the devil. But we have to surrender. We have to surrender to the hand of the vine dresser. We have to surrender to the, to the Savior. We not only want to know God's truth, but we begin to live God's truth. We begin to do the things of God. When, when, we, when we live the life of truth, we cannot be de- deceived by Satan's lies. Because we become so in touch with the revelation of God and what God has given us. You know, here's what Satan does. Satan comes after you. The Bible says the, the thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy. But here's how he attacks you. He tries to undermine God's credibility in your life. He tries to make it hard to live like a Christian. To live the Christian life. He tries to confuse you with false teaching. This is happening all through our culture right now. Tries to confuse you with false teachings. He tries to cause division in the body of Christ because he does not want the body of Christ working together. So he's doing everything he can to disrupt the unity in the church. When the church had unity in the book of Acts, the Holy Spirit fell and God did great things. Are you hearing me? He tries to get you to trust yourself more than you trust God. That's what the devil does. But this is why Ephesians chapter 6 verse 18 is so important. Pray in the Spirit all of the time. That's what Paul says. Pray in the Spirit all of the time. Be persistent in your prayer. Be persistent in your prayer for all of the believers everywhere. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 18. So it's prayer and the truth of God's Word. And it's so important. But we have to live this truth And let me explain it this way. I can't possibly expect to win the battle if I'm going over to the other side now and then and engaging in sin. When we willfully turn from what we know is God's will or his righteousness, we open ourselves up to attack. And I wonder why we're struggling as a country. Are you hearing me? If we decide to live our life like Jesus lived his life and we put on the armor of God, come on, the helmet of, do I need Pastor Arby to come up and teach about the armor of God? We might need to do that. We put on the armor of God, we will be armored against the attacks. We are to resist the enemy with the weapons that God has provided us. The Bible says resist the devil and he will flee. It doesn't say hang out with the devil and he'll just go away. No, you resist the devil. You resist the enemy and he will flee. You know, we are standing at the border that surrounds our hearts and our minds. And the Bible says that God is the helper and God is the one who sustains us in Psalms 54 verse 4. That's why Paul would say this. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 verse 8. Hear me, hear me on this verse this morning. It is huge. It is crucial that you get this verse. But let us who live in the light think clearly perfected by the body armor of faith and love and wearing as a helmet the confidence of our salvation. See, the the hope that comes from, from knowing that we are saved and we are secure in this relationship with Jesus Christ, it gives us the ability to focus clearly on the things of God. It puts all the philosophies of the world and all of the uh, attacks on our mind in proper perspective. And the Holy Spirit, he helps our perspective because his job is to what? Magnify Jesus. His job is to guide us into truth. Knowing and cherishing the fact that we are the children of God and that our salvation is sure it keeps us from giving into those things that would pull us astray. Remember, remember, God's word, it penetrates every area of the human personality to the very deepest part of the inner being. And let me say it like this. How many of you own a Bible? How many of you own three Bibles? How many of you own five Bibles? How many of you own 10 Bibles? How many of you own 20 Bibles? Listen to me. It's not the Bible sitting on the shelf that has the power. It's the Bible, the Word of God, Rhema, 
that which is spoken, that which is uttered, the sword of the Spirit that is coming out of your mouth that has the power. And that word will only come out of your mouth when you have filled your mind. When you have filled your heart with the word of God, you begin to live out the word of God in a relationship with the Holy Spirit in the daily experience. So are you living for God in your daily experience? I'm going to invite the worship team to come back. Pastor Aubrey, are you living for God in your daily experience? A biblical worldview is learning to interpret the realities of life through the filter of Scripture. I'm going to say that again. A biblical worldview is learning to interpret the realities of life through the filter of Scripture. The result is, is that we start to think more like Jesus, amen? Jesus said in Matthew chapter 7, verse 24, Therefore everyone who hears what I say and obeys it is like the wise person who builds his house upon the rock. So, so let's look at the biblical worldview concerning a couple of things before we get ready to take communion. And I'm just going to ask you some very clear, pointed questions. I know where I'm at in my life with these things, but where are you? How is your marriage according to, a, according to the Bible? How are your finances? How is your character? How are your motives? How are you doing your relationships according to Scripture? Are you working on your conversation with God? And are you working on your communication with one another? The Bible says in 1 Thessalonians about the conversation with God, he says, pray without ceasing. Romans chapter 12, it says, never stop, never stop praying. Uh, Colossians chapter 4, it says, let heaven fill your thoughts. Matthew chapter 6 says, seek ye first the kingdom of God. You know, Romans talks about recognizing God's fatherly goodness and love. And man, an understanding that nothing separates us from the love of God. We need to learn how to pray according to God's will for our life and what the word of God says. We need to tell God about our worries, our struggles, our problems, and we need to cast our care and our anxiety on him, amen? This is what it means to saturate your life with the scripture. It's by having active Bible reading. You let the word of God shape you. You synchronize your thinking with the scripture. You use scripture to energize your morning and energize your life. 2 Corinthians chapter 4 says we are in, inwardly we are being renewed day by day. So in the morning you put the scripture in your life and you let that set the tone for the day. Amen. So with the help of the Holy Spirit, we can live. Colossians chapter 3, verse 1. Set your sights on the realities of heaven where Christ sits in the place of honor at the right hand of God. Think about the things of heaven, not the things of the earth. Remember, we work with the Holy Spirit. We work with the Holy Spirit. Say that, I work with the Holy Spirit. I work with the Holy Spirit as he's developing the new nature. I've been raised to new life. He's developing this new way of living for me. I display this new way of living because I'm a new person created in the image of God. The prayer is God produce your character in me. Work on the inside of me. Listen, you are called by God. You've heard me say this before as your pastor, and I pray that you, you never forget this. You are called by God to live the abundant, holy, victorious life in Jesus. A lot of times we just hear that word abundant. But guys, I said holy. It's not just abundant. It's holy. Be ye holy for I am holy. He's holy. When we get to heaven, we're going to experience that in a new way. He's holy. This victorious life, it means a lot of things. It means more influence. It means more responsibilities. Praise God for the kingdom responsibilities. It means the opportunities. It means following the example of Christ. I've come that you might have and enjoy life and have it to the full till it overflows. This is the Christ-directed living that is centered on the Word of God. This is a life that is energized by the nearness of God, the nearness of the Holy Spirit on the inside of us. This is a life that is steeped in the will of God, the will of God. 
This is allowing the Holy Spirit to produce that fruit. Hallelujah on the inside of us. Are you allowing him to do this? Does the culture of your life match the fruit of the Spirit? Let me read it a little differently for you. The fruit of the Holy Spirit. The Amplified Version says, love, unselfish concern for others. That's how it's defined. It would say joy. It would use the word inner peace. It's peace on the inside. And then it would give us this word called patience. But it would say this, it's not the ability to wait. It's not the ability to wait. But it's how we act while we're waiting. How we act while we're waiting. And then kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Self-control. If your desire is to have the qualities listed then you know that the Holy Spirit is working on you. It's pretty simple. And if we follow this lifestyle, these strategies, we become overcomers. If we imitate Christ's compassion, His forgiving attitude, if we let His love reign supreme in our heart, in our life, if we let the peace of Christ rule our hearts and we stay in an attitude of thanksgiving, if we, number four, keep the Word of God at all times. That's huge. That is a, that is a major part of this. You keep the Word of God at all times. If we live as, as, as Jesus' representative, we will be overcomers. By the blood of the Lamb, the word of our testimony, and let's not forget the last part. We did not love our lives even unto death. We forget that. What does that mean? That means you're surrendering all of your life to Him. To Him. You're choosing Him. Like Paul would say, my life is worth nothing less. It's everything and nothing less. It's all about God. My life is worth nothing. I'm here for the sake of the gospel. I'm here for my relationship with Jesus. Amen. I'm sorry. I'm going to ask you to stand with me. If you do not have a cup and bread and you would like one, if you could just raise your hand. We want to make sure that you have what you need to take communion with us today. I was reading in, in my devotions. I don't know if I think it was yesterday. And I'm in the book of Mark, and it was Mark 15, the last few verses of it, and it was the death of Jesus. And the death of Jesus, that's why we take communion, right? That's that's why we come to what we call the table of the Lord, because Jesus died on the cross and he rose from the dead and we remember that it's the foundation of our faith but his death wasn't just to forgive our sins it was also to have a deeper relationship with his people between God and us and he died to give us victory over sin and over death which leads us into deeper relationship with him and it gives us this ability to do this thing that we call prayer. You know, after God delivered his people in the Old Testament from Egypt, he told Moses to build a tabernacle. And in the tabernacle was a room called the, the most holy place. And in the holy of holies was the Ark of the Covenant where God's presence literally hovered. It was in that place. And once a year, the high priest would go in that place and he would sacrifice a perfect, a spotless lamb on behalf of the people. And without that sacrifice, sin would, would, would stand in between God and, and his people. And they wouldn't be in right relationship. And so to remedy that situation once and for all, God sent Jesus 
who was the perfect spotless lamb for us. He was the final sacrifice. And, la and yet when I was reading, you know, there's that, that part where Jesus breathes his final breath and the veil is torn in that most holy place from the top to the bottom. Therefore, there's no longer a need for an intermediary. Or there's no longer a need for someone to go into, to be in God's presence for us. Now we have access for, you know, for that. His sacrifice opened the way for all of us, church, to enter the most holy place. In Hebrews 10, 19 says, Dear brothers and sisters, it says we can boldly enter heaven's most holy place because of the blood of Jesus. By his death, Jesus opened a new and life-giving way through the curtain into the most holy place. And since we have a great high priest who rules over God's house, let us go right into the presence of God with sincere hearts fully trusting him. I, don't, I think sometimes the, the, the greatness, the bigness of that might be lost on us because we didn't have to go through that. We, we haven't had to go right to the priest. And it, it. But church, it's a big deal. It's a big deal that we have access to God. That this table is taking the bread and the cup. It's not just symbolizing something that Jesus did 2,000 years ago. It's not just our get out of jail or get out of hell free card, right? It's not just, oh, he forgave my sins. Now I can live however I want to, Pastor Billy. Just, we just talked about this. It's not an invitation for us to live however we want and, and rely on the grace of God. But it's an opportunity for us to be in relationship, for us to, to enter the most holy place with boldness, with friendship, with intimacy, knowing that we can talk to him, that, that we can know him, that he will know us. He's come to have relationship with us. He's come to have life with us. He's come to have communication with us, to forgive our sins, yes, and to give us victory in life. So before we go any further, let's just close our eyes all around this house today. And I wanna give you an opportunity to ponder that, to meditate on that. I want to give you an opportunity to respond to him. If you don't know Jesus, you can know Jesus today. It's simple. You just have to tell him, Jesus, I want you to be Lord of my life. I have sin and I know I need a savior. Lord, come into my heart and forgive my sins and wash me clean. Be the Lord and Savior of my life. And Lord, if there are those of us here today that we are not in right relationship with you for whatever the reason may be, God, I pray today that you would woo us, that you would draw us back to you, that our ears would hear your voice say, come. Lord, we're so thankful that we don't have to, to go to an intermediary anymore. There's no one that stands between you and us because you sent Jesus. And when he died on the cross, the, the veil was torn. Now we can boldly enter your presence. Your presence is here in this room today. It's not behind a curtain. It's not behind a wall. It's not something only Pastor Billy has access to, but we all have access. Lord, we thank you for your presence. We thank you that you are here with us. We thank you that you call us and you know us and you draw us and you forgive us. 
We thank you for your grace and for your mercy. When Jesus was eating the Last Supper with his disciples, we see this in Mark 14. It says, as they were eating, Jesus took some bread and he blessed it. He gave thanks for it. Then he broke it into pieces and he passed it out to his disciples. And he said, take it for this is my body. Everybody take out your, your little wafers, your little piece of bread. And let's hold it up and let's just say, Jesus, we're so thankful for your body that was beaten for us, that went to the cross for us, that left heaven willingly, that, that was that was." tortured that had thorns placed on your brow that had nails piercing your feet and in your hands that had whip marks all over you thank you for being the pure spotless lamb the sacrifice that we needed the once and for all sacrifice so that we could be in right relationship with you and Lord, I thank you that you didn't just leave it at that. You didn't just die for us. You didn't just make a way for us, but you also live with us. You also sent your spirit to do life with us so we are not alone. So today we say thank you for your sacrifice. Church, let's take the bread together in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. And Mark 14 goes on in verse 23 and says, Jesus took the cup and gave thanks to God for it. He gave it to them and, he, and they all drank from it. And he said to them, this is my blood, which confirms the covenant between God and his people. It is poured out as a sacrifice for many. Church, when he made that statement, he was thinking about you. He was thinking about me. His blood was going to be shed for us so that we could have relationship, so that we could have forgiveness of sins. Lord Jesus, we're so thankful for forgiveness of sins. We're thankful for your blood that washes us white as snow. We're thankful that we, our sins can be forgiven. They can be thrown into the sea of forgetfulness. They can be forgotten as far as the east is from the west and you do not remember them anymore. We're so thankful that we don't have to live under a cloud of condemnation, but we can live free people, forgiven people because of your sacrifice we love you Jesus Lord we worship you oh great and almighty oh one church let's take the cup together in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit In North Pole Assembly of God, we're so glad you could join us online today. I hope you're having a great day. I hope you enjoyed the service. I just want to remind you that if you're planning on worshiping by giving today, there are two different ways you can do that. You can give online through a link on the website, mpag.church, or you can give by mail, 503 KIT Boulevard, North Pole, Alaska, 99705. I hope you're having a great day. We're praying for you praying that the Lord will bless you and keep you. Love you, and we'll see you next week.